pretty common verse. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. God's love. You know, when you think about God and His love for the human race, I always go back to Adam. Because that's where you can see that God truly loves the human race because if you uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, it says that every man came from one blood. And that one blood was Adam. So we were all in Adam at one time. And God loved Adam with all his heart. I could, if you can imagine when, uh, when God made Adam, I, I, well, I usually can get down on my knees so I can't get away from the microphone. But, he, but what God did was he formed Adam and he lifted him up and he looked him right. I know this is, I, I don't, it's, this is not biblical. I just feel like this is how God did it. He lifted him up and he, and he blew it right into his mouth. And when Adam opened his eyes, the first thing he saw was God. And he says, welcome, my child. Amen. And he said, welcome to the human race. His love is, is an eternal love. He will never stop loving us. He says, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. And we know that when Jesus showed the palms of his hands when he came back after the resurrection. He still had the nail prints in his hands. That is the only man-made thing that's, that we'll ever see in heaven is the nail prints in his hand. And every time we come to, to Jesus, we, we will see just how much he loves the, the human race, what he's done for us. He says, though the mountains move, my love will never move from you. He says, even a mother, if a mother forgets her child, he says, I will never forget you. Why do we forget that? We forget that, that God loves us so much. Why do we worry so much? He keeps us in His perfect peace. He keeps us in His perfect who, Whose mind is stayed on God. Do we spend our time talking about our problems and our plans? Do we spend our time thinking about our plans, our problems? Or instead, do we think about spending time with God and, what, and asking Him what is His plan? Matthew 6.33 says, and John Gray preached a beautiful sermon a week and a half ago, and this was his text. But I love this text. It says, But first seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What an incredible statement. So, what, I wanna, what I'm basing my sermon on today is, is the... Uh, and forgive me if I get mixed up here sometimes, but that's just me. Uh, the crossing of the Jordan River and the walls of Jericho. In two incredible stories. Uh, they, if you want to know in the details about uh, 
the Jordan River and the walls of Jericho, you, you please read chapters 44 and 45 of Patriarchs and Prophets. Incredible story. It is, I, I, I don't have time to go into all the details. If I did, we would be here till 6 o'clock tonight or even later because there's some incredible details in that story. Now, Joshua, and we, we want to ask, how did Joshua get the victory? Now, Israel was on the east side of the Jordan, and that is where they had been for 40 years, <laughs> and on the wrong side of the Jordan. God wanted to take them into the land of Canaan 40 years before. And they, are back, they, they have come full circle back around. All the people that started out 40 years ago, all the men, have, they have died out. So this is a new group of people, except for uh, Joshua and Caleb are the only two uh, men who, uh, are, who made it back around because they were the two that came back with a good word. Uh, if, you, if you know the story about the 12 uh, spies that went into Canaan, I, I, I don't want to get into the story because I'm, I'm going to run out of time real fast. But Joshua and Caleb were... were uh, were faithful to God because God was so faithful to them. Uh, now, if you can picture this river, it, it's probably in, in the normal season, not in the flood season, it's probably as wide as this church. Probably not very wide. We, you can walk across it. But in the, the springtime when the, when, the, uh, when the snow on the mountains are, are melting, it's like a raging river and it's about two miles wide and you can imagine Israel they're sitting there they're looking at this huge river well they knew that their parents had come across where the Red Sea God had split the Red Sea for them and so what did Joshua do to get the victory he had a special relationship with God his uh he, his, uh, he, he had inspired by, he was inspired by a living faith in God. He was uh, uh, courageous, he was resolute, he was incorruptible, he was unmindful of selfish interest. He was all about God. He, uh, he loved God and he knew that God loved him. Now, picture this river, this raging river. And Joshua, has, he, he goes to God and, and he, because he, he's really, he's kind of uh, fearful. Because, he, in, in, in the, and I want to be careful about using that word fearful because there's a list of people in Revelation 21.8 that will not be in heaven. And the first of this list, it says, the one who is fearful coward and cowardly will not be in heaven. Now, it says that Joshua, uh, after he got, it says he was, uh, he knew that he couldn't make it without God. Amen. And God had told him that I am going to uh, be with you. So that helped, that, that did everything for him when God told him, he says, I'm going to be with you. So, Joshua sought the presence of God. I just read, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. God, Joshua understood that, that the first thing you do is you seek the presence of God. Should we seek the presence of God? Yeah. Wouldn't the presence of God bring the blessings of God? Amen. Should we seek God's blessing? Or should we seek the presence of God and God will give us His blessing? Amen. If we have God in our lives, the solutions will come and the blessings will come. If we are seeking the solutions and blessings of God without the presence of God, we don't have anything. We have nothing. We want to seek the presence of God to have the blessings of God. Too many of us, we seek the blessings of God first without the presence of God. And, and that was the one thing that Joshua understood. He knew that the only way he can get from the east side of the Jordan 
to the west side of the Jordan. They didn't have a bridge, and they didn't have a helicopter, and they didn't have you know the modern things that we have today to get to the other side. And can you imagine this raging river two miles wide? How are we going to get over there? God says, go over there. And Joshua says, okay. So remember that God, <clears throat> we have to remember that God is in the middle of our battles. And you are not alone. And Joshua knew that. He needed God to be, <coughs> to, he needed God's help. So where was God? Did Joshua know what God did? Did, God, did Joshua know God was there? Of course he did, because he, he could have never made it to the other side of the river. He says, uh, "God is not your enemy. He is there for you all the time. Remember that God is always here for us." Imagine, imagine Joshua before he gets across, just before he crosses the river. He's saying, Joshua, he, he's, he's asking, this is how we're going to take Jericho. Imagine Joshua having a board meeting. And he pulls all his people together. And he says, we're, this is, how are we going to get across over there? And... Uh, Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God's going to go before us. He says He will fight for us. He will give us the strategy that we need. If you have the faith to wait, we can let God do the work. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So what is a good strategy? We should seek God's plan. We should not seek His blessing for our lives. That's kind of a hard thing to, to think about. If we're seeking God's plan, then we will get His blessings in our life. God knows, God needs our help because we always go in the right direction. Is that a true statement? Does God need our help? No. Do we always go in the right direction? No. Good answer. For some reason, when you ask God for help, it seems that God leads you in the wrong direction. I mean... What did he tell Joseph? He told Joseph, I'm going to put you over your brothers. What does he do? He puts, Joseph winds up in prison. That doesn't make any sense. Look at John the Baptist. Another of, of God's children was put in prison. He had his head chopped off. It doesn't make any sense. Christ Object Lessons, page 146, it says, you need not go to the ends of the earth for wisdom, for God is near. It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. Put your talents into work, into the work. Ask God for wisdom, and it will be given you. Take the word of Christ as your assurance. Has he not invited you to come unto him? Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. And we do that all the time. By the way, when I say you, I mean we. Okay, so when I'm, I've have, I have you in my sermon in a lot of places, but it, it means we, me. Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do this, you will lose much. By looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you have evidence of a sickly, enfeebled faith. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord. 
If God allows something in our lives, why do we fight about it? If you're, if you're fighting, you may end up fighting God. Do you ask God to support, do we ask God to support us in our battles? Do we wonder why He doesn't answer? Whose battle should we be fighting? God's or our? When God tells us how to fight, do we try to understand God? Because we're not able to understand God. When you try to understand how God works, you, you go crazy. And you refuse to obey. Faith makes faith doesn't make sense. Joshua told, was told to march around the walls in silence. It doesn't make any sense to us to walk, to, to walk around the walls of Jericho in silence. I mean, I'd be thinking, well, somebody's going to pop me with an arrow. <laughs> but if you look at uh, the story of Jericho, and I would like to touch on that just a, just a little bit. Like I said, I can't go deep into the story. But, as I say, the, the raging waters, they, the priests had the Ark of the Covenant. And they marched to the Jordan River. Now, if, if you look at the Jordan River and, the, and it's raging by, and, I mean, there's a mist, I mean, coming at you. And you see this raging river. And the, pre, the priests were told to go and put your feet in the river. And they, when, as soon as they stepped into the river, this raging river, it, it, it was like uh, the Red Sea. When the Red Sea parted, you had a, a wall of water on both sides. Well, in the river, you had a wall of water, and it, the rest of the water rushed away. And it was dry ground. So they walked to the center of the river with the Ark of the Covenant. And the rest of Israel crossed over to the other side. And it's amazing that from the Jericho Wall to the Jordan River, it's about 10 miles, or less than 10 miles. And they're, and they're crossing, and, and all these heathen people, have, have, they have actually come together. And because they, they knew that the Israelites would eventually come to them, so they had pulled their power. So they weren't scared because they had, you know, they had plenty of people, and but they were scared, uh, especially when they saw the river stop. And they walk, they walk across on dry land. They get to the other side. The priests bring the uh, ark of the covenant to the rest of the way, and then the river starts going again. Well, what does Joshua do? He circumcised all the men. That, that, that's another thing that doesn't make any sense because if the whole army is circumcised, how can they defend themselves? <laughs> they're not doing much. They're not, yeah, they're not, that, it makes no sense. God does not make any sense. I mean, He does in hindsight. When we look in hindsight, we can see the sense that God's made because He, he did this to show how much He cares for His people. Okay. So they were circumcised. And they, they had a chance to heal up. And they were only like two miles from Jericho. So they could attack them any time and they could have destroyed them. But God wouldn't allow that. There, there's just no way. God could see how scared these people were in, this, in, in the land. I mean, nobody stops the river. And nobody split, splits the sea. Uh, I mean, would, would you not have respect for... God, just if you saw that. Even if you heard about it. So, this is when, uh, right after uh, Joshua does the circumcision and everybody gets well, and the day before they march on the city of Jericho, Joshua goes out into the wilderness, <clears throat> away from the camp, and he wants to pray. And when he goes out there, there's a man that he meets that has a sword in his hand. And he asks the man, 
Are you for me, for us, or against us? And that's when he told uh, the Lord told him it was him, and I'm for you. And he says, uh, where you are now is holy ground. Remove the remove your shoes from your feet. And uh, of course, y'all y'all saw me remove my shoes from my feet. But anyway, and and what we what we want to uh, to uh, talk about is. Uh, the, the part of the story that I left off was uh, before they crossed the Jordan River, the, the day before, God said to consecrate yourself. And if you think about the consecration, it, that happened on the Day of Atonement every year back in Israel before they, uh, while they were, anyway, it happened before in Israel. They were to, on the Day of Atonement, they were to search their hearts and they were con to confess their sins. And there was one more thing that they were to do to be uh, purified enough. They were to put away their sins. To consecrate yourself so God can be with you. If you're not, if you don't consecrate yourself, you the sin is still in your heart, in your life, and God, can, you can't, God can't have a relationship with you. God can't protect you, and Joshua knew that, and this is why he was getting everybody in Israel to consecrate themselves so that God could be in the camp with them to protect them, because without this consecration, He couldn't protect them. And it's the same with us today. If we are not consecrated to God. God can't protect us. We need to allow God to consecrate. And where's, where's Jesus right now? He's in the heavenly sanctuary in the second apartment. And what's He doing there? He's cleansing our sins. And as He cleanses the sins in the sanctuary, He's cleansing us and cleansing our hearts. And eventually... When the sin stopped going up to the sanctuary, he's going to come back to take us home. Yeah. Whose battle are we fighting? God's or ours? Now when Joshua's standing there and he's looking at, at this wall, I would question, I, I mean that's just me, I said, how am I going to, how am I going to take out this wall? Joshua doesn't question God. He said, because Joshua asked, Lord, what, would, what do you want me to do? And he says, take your shoes off. And Joshua, it just makes you think, well, that's all you want us to do? Yep. So the first day, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. When God tells us how to fight, we shouldn't try to understand God because we will not be able to understand Him. When you try to understand God, and I believe I've already read this, it says faith makes faith doesn't make sense. When God wants you to obey, don't try to reason. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to explain it. Just obey it. You either obey it or not. Joshua 6.2 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hands, his king, and the mighty men of valor. Joshua 6.2 is before the battle, before the walls fall down. And it says, I have given you. What is that? Is that past tense? Past. The walls are still standing. God, what He speaks, happens. Amen. He says, He says, why are... Why are you struggling in a crisis? God sees the end of the story from the beginning. If you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a loan, whatever it is you're looking for, if you trust God, it's already happened. That's, that's what God is saying to Joshua. Trust me. We've already, it, it's, this has already happened. This is, this is already taking place, so we can trust God. 
Why don't we see it? Because we're blind. And it is stop worrying. Don't put your eyes on the wall. Don't put your eyes on your problem. Where do we want to put our eyes? We want to put our eyes on God. When God gives you a strategy, it might seem crazy. It doesn't make sense. It seems wrong. If it is good and it makes sense, then it's probably your strategy. If it is from God, it seems a little out there. God says this how God says this is how you get the victory. You walk around the wall one time on the first day. Like, okay. You walk around the wall one one time the second day. You walk around the wall one time the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day. And you imagine that, okay, you go out on the seventh day, we, 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 we walk one time yesterday, well, we're just going to walk one time today. But no, you walk around seven times on the seventh day. God says, stop arguing with me. What happens after the seventh day? Well, there's a lot more to it. There's, there's a lot more details there. But the, the one detail that really stood out to me that I, I never paid attention to was the priest had a trumpet. But it, it wasn't a trumpet. It was a ram's horn. And they were the only ones that were allowed to blow the ram's horn. Did, does anybody know what the ram's horn did? It caused the presence of God. And when they blew the ram's horn after the seventh time around, then there was an earthquake. And these giant walls, I mean, we're, we're talking about eight-foot thick walls. I don't know how tall they were, but they were tall. They, they, they crumbled. It didn't make any sense. I mean, it, that's how God works in our lives. It, it really, it doesn't make any sense to us. God says, stop arguing with me. He says, trust and obey, for there's no other way. If it is by faith you are, you are saved, it is not by your strategy or what you do or who you are. Don't look for understanding. Look for faith. Our real problem is not the walls. Was that was the walls a problem for Joshua? No. Our real problem is we don't have faith. Don't pray for a solution. Pray for faith. Because if we got the faith and we have God, then the walls are going to come down. It has nothing to do with us. It says, because faith gives the victory. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Does that, does that mean for the scholars and the, uh, and the theologians also? Lean not on your own understanding. I understand that with all my heart. Not to lean on my own understanding. It makes no sense. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You will not win the battle with human wisdom. Could Joshua have won that battle? Could he have even crossed the river to, to go to the battle? No. He did it by worshiping God. That's why God told him. He says, take your shoes off your feet because it's holy ground. And that's telling me that we need to worship. Instead of using God to, to promote your agenda... Our agenda. We need to let God use us to promote His agenda. It is not about us getting God's support. It's about us giving God our support. Amen. If you are for me, this is God. He said, if you are for me, keep seeking me. Serving me, keep praying and studying. Keep loving and serving. Don't worry about the other things. I myself will go before you. If we're trusting God, He's always going before us. We have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. I know that's why that verse is in 
Revelation 21 8 that those there's a list of people that will not be in heaven and the top of the list is the first one is those who are fearful we if we have God we're not going to be fearful he says I will I myself will go before you I fight for you and provide for you remember the battle